owner is out of ink, so I, it's, I would do it during the class. Anyway, so um, these classes are based on shiurim that I took with Nishmat Seminary in Yerushalayim this summer. And um, this first one, um, first class was given by Noema Novetsky, who is, um, I think, an unbelievable teacher. I had her last year as well. And um, the, the whole theme this year at Nishmat had been about dealing with loss and healing and looking at Jewish sources. And um, so the, the first shear is on infertility because if somebody gets married and wants to have children, the inability to have children is a tremendous um, burden on the, on the would-be parents. And um, if they're not successful, um, very often they feel a tremendous sense of loss for that which they had dreamed and which is not coming true. Um, so if we look at um, Bereshit chapter 30 lines, uh, sentences one to two, it says, when Rachel saw that she had borne Jacob no children, she became envious of her sister. And Rachel said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Jacob was incensed at Rachel and said, can I take the place of Hashem who has denied you fruit of the womb? So in, just in these two sentences, we hear the pain of Rachel Imenu. She's jealous of her sister. This is the same sister um, whom she allowed to marry Yaakov Avinu so as not to embarrass her. And she feels that her life is meaningless without motherhood. Her beloved husband, Yaakov Avinu, has become angry with her. Is this the response to one who's cried out in anguish? Perhaps Yaakov wasn't angry with Rachel, but with the situation itself. Maybe he also wanted a child from Rachel, his favored wife. From these two psukim, we learn that infertility can cause friction between a husband and a wife as it affects the would-be mother and the would-be father. It affects their relationship, how they define themselves as persons, how they define their role in the world, and how they may look at life itself. Now, um, I, I wanted to look at three specific examples. The first one is Sara Imenu. Sarah, the wife of Abraham, who was also infertile, and to look at how she responded to her situation. So it says in Brashit chapter 16, Sukkim 1 to 3, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Avram, look, the Lord has kept me from bearing. Consort with my maid. Perhaps I have, shall have a son through her. And Avram heeded Sarai's request. So Sarai, Avram's wife, took her maid, Hagar the Egyptian, after Avram had dwelt in the land of Canaan 10 years and gave her to her husband Avram as a concubine. So unlike Rachel, when Sarah saw that she was infertile after 10 years of marriage, instead of just complaining, she told Avram Avinu, look, Hashem has stopped me from having children, have sexual relations with Hagar, and maybe I'll be able to obtain a child through her. Sarah's words um, in Hebrew, when she says it may be that I will be able to obtain children by her, in Hebrew, it's ulai ebane mimana. It may be that I will be built up through her, ibane. Sarah's focused on how she can build up her family. And if Hashem is not giving her children directly, maybe she, maybe she can obtain a child another way. If she obtains a surrogate child, her status will be enhanced and she will get credit as a mother. So what seems to be bothering Sarah? She had no children and during her time in, in the era in which she lived, the main function of women was to have children. The absence of children therefore diminished her status, which can be repaired if she gained a child through Hagar. The Radak commenting on the word Ibane says that the son is called Ben because he is built from the father and the mother, Ibane Ben. He says that Sarah was telling Abraham, if you have a son from my servant, I will think of him as my son and he will be for me a son. Rabbi Levi Ben Gershon, the Ralbag, a 14th century commentator, gave a different interpretation to Sarah's intention. 
He posits that Sarah's intention was to change her nature to make pregnancy more likely, a bug, and it is known that excess fat can lessen the seed. And, and if this was the reason for the barrenness of Sarah and Rachel, it is possible that this was to be beneficial. And that is because two women who are married to one man are by definition rivals causing much strife. And this action might result in a lessening of the fat, which is the cause of infertility. So hey, Robin, you're the host now, by the way, you are the host now. I am? Okay, great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you all see that? Can you see that? Can you see the sheet? Yes, we can see. Yes, okay. we see it fine. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so the Ralbag was saying that Sarah's intention was to change her nature. She wanted to have a child and she felt that if she gave Hagar to Avraham as a wife, it would enable Sarah herself to have a child. Now, I, I think if under this view, one would have to assume that Sarah had excess fat and that she wasn't the kind of person who doesn't want to eat when she gets upset and that the infertility arose as a complication of her obesity. I, I know for me, um, when I get upset, all I want to do is um, eat, not, not stop eating. So the Rabag seems to assume that Sarah was the kind of person who would not eat when she was um, upset. And that, and that by giving Hagar to Abraham, she believed that that would help her to lose weight because two women married to the same man would be rivals and the rivalry would instigate her to lose weight. So the point is that the Ralbag felt that Sarah was someone who was looking for a solution and that what mattered was that she tried to figure out what she can do to change her situation. If she had a child in her home, maybe she could change her situation, even if it wasn't pleasant. Now, just a couple of questions to consider are whether in her own pain, Sarah was ignoring the pain of Hagar if she planned to take Hagar's child and then essentially make Hagar childless, or even if the child was still gonna be there with Hagar, if she's going to be treating the child as her own and making the decisions, what is that gonna to do to Hagar? Um, or was she being selfless, doing something for her husband because she so wanted him to have a child? Or was she just shamed by her lack of a child? Both Radak and Ralbag suggest that Sarah believed that Hashem had given her the infertility situation and that she had to figure out what to do about that. Ralbag suggests that her answer was to try to change her own nature by acting proactively. Radak suggests that she sought to change her status by taking a child to love and to raise. Um, another example of an infertile woman was Hana. In contrast to Sarah, Hana was a woman of prayer and a woman ready to take action. Now we read about Hana in the Haftorah on Rosh Hashanah. So here you see in Shmuel Aleph, is there anybody who would like to read this instead of me reading it? Okay, I'll do it. Seems like you always do it for me, Robin. Okay, please. <laughs> there was a man from Ramathayim of Zephutis in the hill of the country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jorocham, son of Eliu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and the and Ephraimite. He had two wives, one named Hannah and the other named Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah was childless. The man used to go out from his town every year to worship and to offer sacrifices to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of, of Eli, were priests of the Lord there. One such day, Elkanah offered a sacrifice. He used to give portions to his wife Penina and to his sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he would give one portion only, he would give one portion only though Hannah was his favorite, for the Lord had closed her womb. Moreover, her rival, to make her miserable, would taunt her, and the Lord that the Lord had closed her womb. This happened year after year. Every time she went up to the house of the Lord, the other would taunt her, so that she wept and would not eat. Her husband Alkanah said to her, Hannah, 
Why are you crying? Why aren't you eating? Why are you so sad? Am I not more devoted to you than 10 sons? So the Tanakh first introduces us to Elkanah, a man with two wives, Chana and Penina, one who was loved and one who was less loved, which is similar to the situation of Yaakov with Rachel and Leah. Elkanah made yearly sacrifices at Shiloh and he gave Penina and her children their portion, but he gave Chana a double portion because he loved her. Every year, Penina upset Chana because she was barren. And um, just as an aside, think now about what the Rabag said about rivals and the impact of rivalry on a woman's ability to conceive. Chazal tells us that Penina would ask Chana things like, oh, don't you have snacks for the children? Oh, have you prepared clothes for the children? They suggest that Penina wanted to make Chana upset so that she would daven, but Penina was doing this year after year. Chana became most upset at the sacrifices. Why at this time? Because Elkanah is giving 10 portions to Penina and her children. So it makes it obvious that one wife has children and one does not. Also, when making the sacrifice, it's a time of feeling close to Hashem. The annual sacrifice was a milestone event in their lives, a time to reflect about what had changed. The sacrifice was like a bracha, and for Hana, she felt she couldn't sacrifice if she was so upset. If she and her husband were giving to Hashem, why was he not giving back? And Elkanah responds by asking Hana why she's so upset, and isn't he better to her than 10 sons? He can't understand why she's not eating and why she's crying. As women, we understand why Hana would be upset to get that response because it suggests that Elkanah just doesn't understand that he is not her child, which is what she wants. He seems to be trying to say, I love you. It's okay that you don't have children. He's speaking from a place of love, but ask yourself if he really understands her pain. He's telling her, look how much I love you and I hope you love me enough so we can relate to one another. He doesn't understand the stigma that she feels at being barren. Now in source five, um, whoops. Okay, yeah, okay, source six, Shmuel Aleph. Um, um, Cheryl, can you keep reading, please? Yeah, sure. Let me see my off, yeah. Okay, so after they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and the priest, the priest Eli was sitting on the seat near the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. In her wretchedness, she prayed unto the Lord, weeping all the while. And she made the vow, O Lord of hosts, if you will look upon the suffering of your maidservant and will remember me and not forget your maidservant, and if you will grant your maidservant a male child, I will dedicate him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor shall ever touch his head. So Hannah is davening to a Kaddish Baruch Hu with a bitter soul. She hasn't been comforted by her husband, and she's steadily weeping. The Tanakh, the Tanakh describes her praying and weeping with the words, Batipalel al Hashem Ubaho Tikve. Note the double language, Ubaho Tikve. Whenever double language is used in Tanakh, it's significant, often meant to emphasize. So we know that Kana was really, really sobbing. The Tanakh says that she went into the Mishkan after they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh. We don't know who they are. Maybe it includes Hannah, so maybe if she ate and drank something, maybe she had some measure of comfort for her husband. Maybe they is everybody else who was, who was with um, Elkanah's party. One can almost hear her say, yes, I get that you love me, but I'm still empty inside. But as I said, maybe they are Elkanah, Panina, and their children, and maybe Hannah didn't join in the, the meal other than to eat, maybe nibble perhaps what she was obligated to eat from the korban. Imagine yourself in Hannah's position, going to the Mishkan to daven to Hashem. Would you demand a child from him? Would you request one? Would you be angry? Most likely you would plead and try to make a deal, try to negotiate with Hashem who controls everything. Maybe Hannah was trying to make a deal with Hashem, uh, negotiating with him. You bless me with a child and I'll dedicate him to you. She could just be feeling sorry for herself and just pouring out her emotions. She could be angry with Hashem 
asking him where he is and why he is not helping her. Um, the Tanakh says that Khanna's tefillah was one pasuk long. She's filled with anguish and is pleading to Hashem to remember her, not to forget her. And she's promising that if he will give her a child, she will give him back to Hashem all the days of his life and that he would be a Nazir. Khanna, who was so desolate and longing for a child, is nonetheless willing to give him up. In other words, she herself won't raise him and enjoy the nachas that we as mothers get from our children. And indeed, we know that her child did grow up in the Mishkan. One finds it hard to believe that after longing so much for child, she would be so willing to give up that child. But that promise to Hashem tells us something about her desire for a child. Hannah did not want a child for herself to fulfill her own need for motherhood, but rather to have a child to give to the world. She wants to have a child to change her status. And her statement to Hashem contains a huge element of sacrifice and that she was willing to have a child and give it up for the world at large. She sounds calm, but the psukim around her vow show that she is not calm. Um, okay, let's see if I can get to the next source. Um, okay, um, Cheryl, would you read source eight, please? Okay. As she kept on praying before the Lord, Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah was praying in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice could not be heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Sober up. And Hannah replied, oh no, my Lord, I am a very unhappy woman. I have drunk no wine or other strong drink, but I have been pouring out my heart to the Lord. Do not take your maidservant for a worthless woman. I have only been speaking all this time out of my great anguish and distress. Then go in peace, said Eli, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She, ans she answered, you are, the most, you are most kind to your handmaid. So the woman left and she ate and was no longer downcast. So Hannah's davening to herself, the Hebrew words for the italicized portion up at the um, first and second lines is midaberet al Now I learned that if you check that phrase in a concordancia, one sees that it means speaking to convince in a passionate way. There's a deeper meaning in Hannah's tefillah. The Gemara Brachot gives a different statement as to her prayer and its meaning, and it adds certain elements to her emotions. Let's see, this is the one here. Uh, okay, so um, this is a source from uh, page 31 of Gemara Brachot. The bold faced words are those of the Gemara and the non bold faced are the, are the fill in words to help us understand the meaning. Cheryl? Okay, Rabbi Elazar said in the name of Rabbi Yossi ben Zimra, Hannah spoke to, to God concerning matters of her heart. She said before him, Master of the universe, of all the organs you created in a woman, you have not created, you have not created one in vain. Every organ fulfills its purpose. Eyes to see, ears to hear, a nose to smell, a mouth to speak, hands with which to perform labor, feet with which to walk, breasts with which to nurse. If so, these breasts that you placed upon my heart, to what purpose did you place them? Was it not in order to nurse with them? Grant me a son and I will nurse with them. Hannah spoke to Hashem about her heart, about what was in her heart. Rabbi Elazar says that Hannah was telling Hashem, you created women, all women with a purpose. You gave us eyes to see, ears to hear, nose to smell, a mouth to taste hands, feet, and breasts to nurse. My, my breasts are an organ, they have a use. Give me a child so that I can nurse the child and use the breasts that you gave me. Chazal say that Hannah was actually impertinent toward HaKadosh Baruch Hu. In describing Hannah praying, the Tanakh says, the hit palel al Hashem. And the Gemara says, and Rabbi Elazar said, Hannah spoke impertinently toward God on high. As it is stated, and she prayed unto the Lord, as opposed to the common phrase, to the Lord. 
This teaches that she spoke importantly toward on high. The Gemara also comments on Hannah's prayer and the way that she addressed Hashem as Hashem Tzvaot. Let's see if I can get that one. Okay. In her, yeah. In her prayer, Hannah said, and she swore with an oath and said, Lord of hosts, Hashem Tzvaot, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, and will give your maidservant a male child, I will give him to the Lord all the days of my life, and there shall be no razor upon his head. Rebbe Elazar said, from the day that the Holy One, blessed be he, created his world, there was no person who called the Holy One, blessed be he, Lord of hosts, until Hannah came and called him Lord of hosts. It's the first time in the Bible that, the God, is, that God is referred to by this name. Rebbe Elazar explains that Hannah said, before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the universe, are you not the Lord of the hosts and of all of the hosts of hosts of creations that you created in your world? Is it difficult in your eyes to grant me one son? So Hannah was the first person to refer to Hashem as Hashem Tzvaot, Hashem the Lord of hosts. The phrase Tzvaot also comes up in Sefer Shemot in Exodus, but there the order is reversed, is reversed and is Tzvaot Hashem. So Hannah was saying to Hashem, you created the whole world. You mean to say you can't give me one child? Is it too hard for you? She's like a beggar at the king's palace where there is a banquet with lots of food, but people won't give him a crumb. This parable is given in the Gemara. Cheryl, please. Okay, I'm Garen. The Gemara suggests a parable. To what is this similar? It's similar to a flesh and blood king who made a feast for his servants. A poor person came and stood at the door. He said to them, give me one slice of bread. And they paid him no attention. He pushed and entered before the king. And he said to him, my lord, the king, from the entire feast that you have prepared, is it so difficult in your eyes to give me a single slice of bread? Okay, thank you. Um, the Gemara continues to explain Hannah's prayer. Um, as for the double language in the verse, if you will look upon, Imra Otir Eth, Rabbi Elazar said, Hannah said before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the universe. If you will look upon Ra'o, if you will look upon me now, and the word for look upon Ra'o, fine. And if not, in any case, you will see, Tir Eth. And is that clear that you understand the, the double negative, the double use of the um, two roots there? If you will look upon me now, fine. And if not, in any case, you will see. So look upon is Ra'o and you will see Tiret. It's the same show, Rish. So um, by using these double words, Hana is saying to Hashem, if you answer my prayer, that's great. But if not, I'm going to see what I can do to change my situation. What was Hannah threatening? She said, I will go and seclude myself with another man before Elkanah, my husband. Since I secluded myself, they will force me to drink the soda water to determine whether I have committed adultery. Mm -hmm. I will be found innocent. And since you will not make your Torah false, I will bear children. With regards to a woman who was falsely suspected of adultery and drank the soda water, the Torah says, and if the woman was not defiled but was pure, then she shall be acquitted and she shall conceive. That, that um, is in Bamidbar. So Khan is telling Hashem that if need be, she is going to closet herself with a man who is not her husband so that she would have to be tested as a sota, an unfaithful wife. She says she will be found innocent and then she will be a child because the Torah promises that if a woman is falsely accused of being a sota, she shall bear children to her husband. Hana is threatening and begging Hashem and letting him know that she is so desperate to have a child and so angry that she will now use desperate measures and go to great lengths to succeed. Now, just as an aside, not all the rabbis agreed that this was the meaning of the Pasuk in Bamidbar. Rabbi Yishmael said it meant that if a woman was barren and was falsely accused of being a sota, that she would conceive. 
Rabbi Akiva disagreed um, with the interpretation of Hana because if that was the case, he feared a lot of Jewish women would do the same thing and that would be inappropriate for chaste Jewish women to put themselves in a situation where they would be accused of being a sota. He, held that the, he holds that the verse means um, instead that it's a promise for greater ease in childbirth. If a woman previously had pain um, and passed the test of the sota, she would now give birth with ease. If she had short, weak children, now she would have tall, strong children. If her children previously were unattractive, she now would have fear children. If she had one child, now she would give birth to twins. If she had daughters, now she'd have sons. We should also look at the um, reaction of Eli, the Kohen in the Mishkan. Only Hannah's lips were moving because she was speaking of matters in her heart. She was pouring out her heart to Hashem and was silent or at the very least quiet. Ellie misinterprets the words on the Urim Tumim, the priestly breastplate, and thinks she is drunk, Sheker, rather than understanding that she was kashir, um, kosher, truthful. Um, the, at this time, most people served Hashem using korbanot, sacrifices, rather than tefillah, prayer. The use of the word hit palel is itself very interesting um, to describe Hana praying, as that word only comes up in Tanakh eight times before this. The first time was after Abimelech took Sarah and Hashem punished Abimelech and told him that Abraham was a prophet and that he will pray for you. Another example was when Moshe Rabbeinu prayed on behalf of the Bnei Yisroel. Such examples suggest that prayer on behalf of another or by a leader for others. Maybe Hana was the first to innovate the idea of personal tefillah, personal prayer, and Eli the Kohen thought she was drunk because he'd never seen it before. When Eli confronts Hana, she tells him she's sad and hasn't drunk wine nor strong side drink, and that she's poured out her soul before the Lord. The Hebrew words used are ve'eshpach et nafshi lifnei Hashem, nefesh meaning soul. She poured out not just her heart to plead, but also her anger. Ellie tells her to go in peace and blesses her that her petition should be granted. That is that Hashem should bless her with a child. And when Hannah leaves, she's no longer downcast. Why was she no longer sad? Maybe she got her anger and bitterness out of her system. Sometimes tefillah itself, even without an answer from Hashem, helps and is a source of comfort. Maybe it was because Ellie blessed her that her request be granted. Also note that after this experience, um, the Tanakh says that Hannah eats, suggesting that maybe she really didn't have an appetite before, but now that she's davin, she feels comforted after her tefillah and after the blessing and she's able to eat. When the Tanakh wants to get across certain messages, new things are mentioned, or sometimes a guiding word comes up repeatedly to make a point. In the story of Hannah, the Hebrew word ka'as comes up twice as a noun and twice as a verb and explains the level of anger felt by Chana. The words ish and isha come up seven times as does the word natan. And you know, seven is a special number in Judaism. Seventh day of rest, seven days of the week, Shemitah cycle, Sheva brachot, etc. Elkanah gives portions of the sacrifice to the family members and gives more to Chana but she doesn't want to be given, she wants to give back. She wants to be a mother, which is all about giving. And at the end of her story, she does give back her child and dedicate him to Hashem. Some Hebrew programs um, now are able to use algorithms to calculate how many times a word comes up in a section or how frequently it, is in a, it appears in comparison to its use in other parts of Tanakh. The most significant word in the story of Kana is the root source, the Shoresh, Gimel Mem Lamed, Gamal, to wean. The next most significant Shoresh is Ayin Mem He, Ama, maidservant. The Shoresh of prayer, Pe Lamed Lamed, is used 35 times more in the story of Hana than elsewhere. The story of Hana is one of crying out to Hashem. The Gemara, and I'm not sure which one or, or where in the Gemara, says that nursing is giving. After Hannah nurses her son and weans him, she gives him back to Hashem. 
Gamal can be understood as nursing or as associated with Gamila Chasadim, acts of loving kindness. The Tanakh is showing that motherhood is to give. Hannah was allowed to be angry with Hashem and to give to Hashem. Anyone may pour out her heart to Hashem. As an aside, the Gemara Brachot also says that in the oath um, and prayer uttered by Hana, she refers to herself as your servant, Amatecha, three times. The afflic- see the affliction of your maidservant, do not forget your maidservant, and if you will give to your maidservants. The Hebrew words are Ba'ani um, Amatecha, Al Tishkach et Amatecha, and Venatata la Amatecha. Rabbi Yossi, the son of Rabbi Hanina said, why are these three maidservants, Amatot, cited in this verse? They're cited to teach that Hana said before HaKadosh Baruch Hu, master of the universe, you have created three crucibles potentially leading to death in a woman where she is particularly vulnerable. Alternatively, some say, master of the universe, you have created three accelerants of death in a woman. They are mitzvot that as a rule pertain to women. Observing the halachot of a menstruating woman, separating challah from dough and lighting Shabbat candles. Have I ever violated one of them? Chana attests to her, sat, her, to her status as Hashem's maidservant, his amma. The reference to these three mitzvot is drawn from the etymological simil- similarity between amatacha, your maidservant, and mita, death. The discussion in the Gemara about the three times the word Amma is used is an example of the importance not only of the words of Tanakh, but of their repetition and frequency. Now, Hannah prayed for a male child. I also want to point out from Gemara Brachot a discussion on this request. Let's see if I can pull that up. Uh, okay. Um, Cheryl, are you able to read? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, would you read? The Gemara Gemara asked, what is the meaning of an offspring of men? Rav said, Hannah prayed for a man among men, a son who would be outstanding and exceptional. And Shmuel said, this expression means an offspring who who will anoint two men to royalty. And who were they? Saul and David. And Rabbi Yochanan said, Hannah prayed that she would bear an offspring who would be the equivalent of two of the world's greatest men. And who were they? Moses and Aaron. As it is stated, Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among those who call his name in Psalms 99.6. In this verse, Hannah's son Samuel is equated to Moses and Aaron. And the rabbis say, an offspring of men Hannah prayed for, an offspring who could be inconspicuous among men, that he would not stand out in any way. The Gemara relates when Rav Dimi came from Eretz Israel to Babylonia, he said in an explanation that Hannah prayed for her son would not be conspicuous among men, neither too tall nor too short, neither too small nor too fat, neither too white nor too red, and neither too smart nor too stupid. So it's two very different views about what is meant by um, Zerah Anashim, an offspring of men. Was she... Um, davening for for a son who would be exceptional or somebody who would not in any way stand out and just would be perfect. So um, so you have Sara Imenu who um, seeks to change her status or to change her nature. You have Hannah who davens for um, a child and is willing to go to great lengths in order to bargain with HaKadosh Baruch Hu for him to grant her a child. And then the, the third example of a barren woman is the Shunammite woman that we know from the story of Elisha. Cheryl? Okay, Can one day succeed? Elisha visited Shunam and a great woman lived there and she urged him to have a meal. And whenever he passed by, he would stop there for a meal. Once she said to her husband, I am sure it is a holy man of God who comes this way regularly. Let us make a small enclosed upper chamber and, and, a place, and place a bed, a table, a chair, and a, lampstand, and a lampstand there for him so that he can stop there whenever he comes to us. One day 
he came there and he retired to the upper chamber and he lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call that Shimonite woman. And he called her and she stood before him and he said to him, tell her you have gone to all this trouble for us. What can we do for you? Can we speak in your behalf to the king or to the army commander? She replied, I live among my own people. What then can be done for her, he asked. The fact is, said Gehazi, she has no son and her husband is old. So one of the first things we learn about the Shunammite woman who isn't named is that she is a great woman, Ishagadola. We also learn she's very hospitable. The Navi, the prophet Elisha, went to Shunam and she urges him to stop and eat at her house. And he did that every time he passed through. He was so frequent a visitor that the woman approached her husband and got her husband's okay to make a little room for Alicia upstairs. And she furnished it well with a bed, table, chair, and light so that he would always have a place to stay in Shunem. From this, we can also deduce that she was a wealthy woman and she was able to set aside a room for him and provide appropriate accommodations. So she has wealth, but more importantly, she has midos and practices haknasas orchim, welcoming guests to the nth degree. Alicia asks his servant to ask her what can be done for her. What does she need? Alicia is willing to speak on her behalf to the king or the army commander. And she replies, I'm fine, I'm with my own people. She's satisfied with her lot in life. And she's saying, I don't really need anything. It's Gehazi, Alicia's servant, who speaks up and tells Alicia, she has no child and she's married to an old man. So she's unlikely to get a child. In contrast to the story of Hana, in which we learn in the second Pasuk that Hana was barren, here we don't learn until verse 14 that she has no children. In the story of Hana, the barren woman Hana was upset. Here, the Shunammite woman does not appear to be upset. Maybe that's why Elisha, who apparently was a regular visitor to her home, didn't even realize that she was childless. She wasn't spending time bemoaning her situation and he apparently never realized that she was barren. Maybe he thought she had a child living elsewhere. Note also that the Tanakh defines her as a great woman, Isha Gedola, not as a barren woman. So Rabbi Eliyahu Samet um, gave a um, shear in Yeshivat Haaretzion, um, the virtual base medrash. And he said, the starting point um, is the question raised earlier why does the story hide the fact of the Shunammite's barrenness, introducing her as a great woman? It seems that the Shunammite is presented before us as one who, despite her infertility, doesn't suffer greatly from this. She is not presented as barren because this was not central to her life or how she presented herself to the outside. She is presented as a great woman. She fills her life with acts of chesed and hospitality with learning. All this she served to substitute for the loss of motherhood and having a child. So in Rabbi Samet's opinion, despite her infertility, the Shunammite woman doesn't suffer greatly because she spilled her life with other things which substitute for the, la for the loss of motherhood. So the Shunammite woman presents the third Jewish model for dealing with the loss of, of, of the ability to have children with the problem of infertility. She accepted her lot and figured out what she was supposed to do with her life and how she could contribute to this world, even if not as a mother. She figured out a way to fill her life with meaning. And she is a person who gives and gives and gives. Um, our, my teacher, Noema Novetsky, shared with us a story um, by a woman who had a handicapped child and had written on a blog for parents of handicapped children. She said, sometimes you have to let go of the life you hoped for and trust in the life that is. Um, my teacher lives this view as she also has a disabled child. And um, she taught us that the three models for dealing with the issue of infertility can be applied to any challenge in life. So what are these three models? Sarah's plan A was to have a child naturally. And when that didn't work, her plan B was to be a surrogate mother. And alternatively, if we accept the view of Ralbag, that she sought to change her nature and that being overweight was an impediment to her fertility, then part of her plan B was to bring in a, a second wife, not only to 
as not only to create a surrogate wife, but I'm surrogate mother, but also to create a rival and encourage her to lose weight. In both of these options, given her failed plan to conceive, Sarah seems to be saying that she has a role in life and she seeks to figure out what she personally can do to accomplish her goal of having a child. Chana, on the other hand, turns to Hashem to change her situation. We, she may sound matter of fact, but we know she is actually filled with anger and anguish. She's passionate. Let me use the breasts you gave me. And she's even willing to undergo the SOTA test to be ensured of having a child, such as her strong faith in Hashem, so that even if she's falsely accused of being a SOTA, she'll be blessed with a child as promised in the Torah. The Shunammite woman, in contrast, decided not to define herself only by motherhood or the lack thereof, and instead sought to identify how she could give to the world if not through childbirth. And instead she became a woman of chesed and gave back that way. How can we apply these models to today's challenges? We can seek to change our situation or change ourselves and our ability to cope with the situation. We can dive and have faith that everything is in Hashem's hands even our challenges, and or we can accept a situation and make the best of things, finding the good even in what seems bad. A final related issue is a discussion in various sources as to why our imahot, our matriarchs, Sarah, um, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah were barren. Not, not so much Leah, I don't think Leah had a problem, but certainly Sarah and um, Rivka and Rachel at least initially had difficulty conceiving. According to the Medrash Bereshit Rabbah, Rabbi Levi said in Rabbi Sheila's name and Rabbi Chelbo, Rabbi Yochanan's name, because the Holy One of Blessing yearns for their prayers and supplications, as it is written, O oh my dove, you on the clefts of the rock, let me see your face, let me hear your voice. Rabbi Huna, in the name of Rabbi Chia Bar Abba said, so that they may pass the greater part of their life without hard work. Bli Shibud, hard work. Does Rabbi Levi believe that our matriarchs were barren because Hashem wanted them to dive into him? And Rabbi Huna said it was so that they could accomplish greater things without the hard work of motherhood. The Hebrew words used in the Medrash, blishibud, literally mean without enslavement or servitude. But questions raised by this Medrash is why Hashem needs their tefillot or ours. Indeed, what barren woman would not want the hard work, even the servitude of motherhood? One possible answer is that perhaps Hashem wanted the matriarchs to understand him better, to have a better connection with him so that they would be able to pass that on to the children that they would subsequently have. Rabbi Zalman Sorotsky, who lived in the 1900s, had a different view of why the Imahot were barren. He wrote, the patriarchs were barren so that they would be free to bring new people under the wings of the Shechina. They had children only in their old age when they had fulfilled this obligation. His view was that Hashem didn't bless our forefathers and our foremothers with children because they still had certain things to accomplish. And Hashem was letting them know that at that point in time, when they were younger, he had different goals for them to complete before they could bear and raise children. Another Medrash, Tana Davi Eliyahu says, one time I was traveling from place to place and I came across an old man who said, Rabbi, why did the women of Yisrael suffer by not having children? I said to him, my son, it is because the Holy One, blessed be he, loves them totally and is happy about them and wants to refine them so that they will be favored with mercy. The words for refine them are the mitzrapem and favored with, so that they will be favored with mercy. Kadei sheyif kashu rachamim al banim. The view of this medrash is that our foremothers were barren because Hashem loved them and wanted to refine them so they'd be filled with mercy. Mitz, um, the word the mitzvah pem is related to purifying. And the words used for they will be favored with mercy, um, could also be translated as so that they will seek mercy for their children. This view suggests that suffering sometimes helps us to grow and Hashem wanted them and us when we go through these travails to grow in our relationship with him and as persons. When we think about the infertile women discussed in this year, Sarah, Hannah, and the Shunammite women, 
fact, we see his toddlers, that his personal efforts that are being made to overcome an obstacle, we see davening, we see issues related to how one defines oneself and how one understands the hardship itself. When we think about our foremothers, maybe we need to change our perspective on their infertility. Maybe it wasn't Hashem that made them barren, maybe rather because they were barren, these women became our matriarchs and grew into greatness through their trials. Um, one final thought, some of you may have heard about a piece called Welcome to Holland, which was written by a woman who had a handicapped child. The piece talks about a person who plans a trip to Italy and in preparation buys clothes appropriate for the climate, studies the geography of Italy, learns Italian, etc. But when she gets off the plane, instead of being in Italy, she finds herself in Holland and now she needs to adjust and cope where she actually is. That's the challenge, not only of the parent of a disabled child, but of anyone facing a challenge. We have to accept that we are where we are. Like now we're in the midst of this terrible pandemic, even though we'd intended to be somewhere else or doing something else, we have to accept that this is where we're supposed to be and we have to find ways to make the best of it. Thank you very much for listening. I have a question. <laughs> I did ask a question. Sure. Just my hand. <laughs> um, so my question just was, when you, when you summarized everything, you talked about the three different approaches, obviously to women who are barren. Right. Um, and however, you never tied anything into um, Rivka who you spoke about and her husband being angry with her or she being angry with her husband and, the, and that, that, that part of the relationship. So, you know, when obviously, as you said, that there's going to be that stress, you know, as well. How does it, you know, like how would, how did, did you hear any suggestions of how a woman or a couple handles that part of the situation, you know, besides? I, I, I you know, my understanding is that Rachel Imenu Davind and, you know, Hakadosh Baruch, who did in fact give her the two children, but, um, you know, the, the example. I'm just saying, you remember your reference at the beginning was how when she said she was barren and then, 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 then Yaakov was like rude to her in a way, not rude. I mean, whatever he said back, he said yeah. to her back, he said, who do you think I am? I'm God that I can give you a child. You know, it was like, that's what I'm talking about, the conflict. Uh, yes, I know she did get her two children and whatever, but I'm just saying the conflict that there was between the couple, which I think is a big issue for people who can't get, you know, they can't have children. I think, you know, people when they can't have children, couples, I think there's a conflict between husband and wife that you mentioned. Ab and absolutely. absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's why people have to, you know, figure out how they're going to cope with it. Um, you know, I, when I married my husband, he was a widower and that wasn't at all a problem for me. I was thrilled. Um, I felt that I was, you know, getting um, two brachot for the price of one, so to speak. But um, there were women who would, you know, that I have met who will not consider marrying someone who is a widower um, or guys. I, I mean, I only speak about women. I can't speak about guys who don't want to marry a widow. But um, there are people who, um, when they're barren, they have no problem adopting. And there are those who say, I only want, you know, flesh of my flesh. So I think it all has to do with how people respond to the situation and, you know, what they, what they choose to do, either individually or as a couple, to respond to the challenge. You know, if the most important thing to um, a couple that can't have children is to have a child, then you have an adoption option. But if you only want your own flesh, then, you know, since, since the, if the doctors can't do it with in vitro and whatever else is out there, then you're left with davening. You know, there are some people that just say, okay, this is not what HaKadosh Baruch Hu intended for me. So I won't have children. So I will, you know, I will find a way to satisfy that need. And um, they become terrific aunts, uncles, maybe they're teachers, maybe they're pediatricians, uh, you, you know, daycare workers, they, they find a way to, to give back or to be around children, whatever it is, but each person has to deal with the challenge. And, you know, it's not an easy um, challenge by any means. Okay, thank you, Ron, thanks. Sure. It was anyway, a great show, very good show, thank you. Thank you.
Do anybody have anything else? I, I really love with people to, I hope for the next one that more people will, um, will help read. And, and if you have questions, please uh, feel free to ask. I can't guarantee I'll have the answers, but um, the questions themselves are to- I had a question. What was the name of that 20th century rabbi that you referred to? Um, rabbi Samet? Is no, but there was another one. I thought you were referred to another one. Rabats or something. I, I had I had referred to somebody from the Middle Ages. To well, I, I I referred to um the that was there was somebody in the 20th century that you referred to. Okay, let me go back and look. Hold on. It's Rebecca, by the way. Uh, okay, nice to nice to meet you. Okay, so I have Rabbi Simit and uh -huh. um Rabbi Zalman Saratsky, but he's the Oznayim Latora. He's not, um, he, he's, I think, like uh, Zalman Saratsky, S O R O T S K Y. I think he was the 1900s. Okay. Um, and I'm, I think the others were just the, the Rabag and, and Rabak. Okay. Okay. I have a question, Robin. Sure. Hi, honey. I find it difficult to believe that to, when the rabbi said that she was fat, that she couldn't have a child because when Abraham went to different places, he always told Sarah, say you're my sister because I'm afraid somebody's going to yeah. want you. And the two kings, the two places where they went in Egypt and I think Gerar, both the kings wanted her. So I mean, if you're fat, you still can be beautiful, but I don't think you'd be so beautiful that the kings would want you. So I had difficulty to think that she was fat. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree with that interpretation either, but I'm just sharing it with you because it had been shared with me. But that the other way of looking at it is that, you know, if she was more of a Zoptig woman, then she may have been very attractive within a Rubenesque kind of fashion. And so, you know, I, I don't know, like it, it, somebody, somebody who's very Rubenesque another person might think of as being fat, whereas, uh, you, you know, the, the people who admire- Voluptuous. Right. Voluptuous. Right, whereas the people who admire those very zaftig uh, women- Voluptuous. Would, would, right, right would, would, would have a totally different take on it. But I, I hear but I hear you, honey. I, I think it's- I feel like the word fat, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 these are men talking about, you know, motivations of women. So, uh, and and women from an, and, and men coming from, you know, different centuries. I'm just sharing the thought with you. Okay, very good to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Oh, thank okay, you very much. Night, everybody. Okay, Bye. thank Bye. you so much. Take care. Have a great week. Bye. Bye. Bye.